time this morning. Uh, so I want you to kind of get yourself into a study mode uh, as opposed to being preached at. And uh, uh, so I want to go to John 10.10. 10. <clears throat> and I thought this morning as he cometh to steal. He cometh to steal. Scary, isn't it? John 10.10. 10. <clears throat> I mean, it says, it says here, it says, uh, For the thief cometh not, but to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that thou mayest have, have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. But the, the, the part that I want to focus upon is the first part. He cometh not but to kill, to steal, <coughs> And to what he cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And our question this morning is this what is he coming to steal? What is he coming to destroy? What is he coming to kill? Amen. And you see, if you don't know the answer to that, if you don't know what that is, how are you going to defend what it is he's after? How are you going to protect that thing that he seeks? Amen. Now, truly, brothers and sisters, there are so many things that we need to protect ourselves from. Amen. There are so many things that we must defend ourselves from. Amen. We, 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 we know Paul's uh, 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 scripture there in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5 where he says, that we must abstain from all appearance. We must abstain from all appearance. Not, not just the act, but the appearance of evil. You know, and, 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 and of course, uh, amen, uh, in many ways on the surface, that just seems an impossibility. You know, when you consider that just, you know, just where you work, just where you walk, just in your area of influence, just evil is on every side. Amen. And then we have the internet and the television and the radio, the airwaves are full of evil. It's almost like, you know, Paul, come on. How are we going to do this? And then, then we have the words of our Lord Jesus Christ who told us that, that in the last days iniquity would abound. And isn't it just so in our day? It is exponentially abounding. You know what? You just get, it doesn't matter where you look now. There's a woman kissing a woman, a man's kissing a man. It's a breath of fresh air when you actually see a man and a woman kissing. Isn't that right? It becomes an unusual thing. You know, uh, not too many years ago, probably our grandparents would have been embarrassing a man and a woman kiss. Today it's a breath of fresh air. I'm just trying to show you how much, you turn, it doesn't matter what, which television program you watch today, there's always a man kissing a man, a woman kissing a woman. Because iniquity is abounding in an exponential manner. Just as Jesus said it would. But yet Paul says we must abstain from all appearance of evil. And we say, my Lord, Paul, you don't live in our day. It almost sounds like an impossibility. You know, we live in a day where many who claim to be in Christ have lost the revelation of the purity of Christ, have lost the revelation of purity and holiness itself. And man, we all claim to be in Christ, even here, we all claim to be in Christ, but we have lost the revelation of what it is to be pure and what it is to be holy. Remember, we used to have a scripture up there without holiness. No man shall see the Lord. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Or is that just a hopeful wish? Amen. Again, Paul said to abstain from all appearance of evil. But the truth is we spend so much time plugging up the holes, don't we? We spend just so much time in that defensive mode of trying to plug this hole and, and that hole. It, it wears us out. 
and then we slip there, we miss, and what? We lose our joy. We begin to feel condemned. Amen, because we're too busy plugging up all the holes. Amen, you turn the TV on, on or whatever, and you, and you, or down the road, you walk around, and you see a man kiss a man, and you're not supposed to look at that. But you've looked. It's entered through your eye gate into your heart and mind. You're forever wounded, if you like. I was, who was it? David who said he, he would not even look upon a maid. But we look upon them all the time. I'm saying is we're plugging up holes all the time and this plugging up the holes is making us weary, causing us to lose our joy. We don't have the peace of God that we must have and we should have, amen. We're wearing ourselves out. But listen, if there was only one hole we needed to stop and in the act of Filling, blocking, filling this one hole, we filled all holes. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah. Amen. Wouldn't that be just wonderful? Amen. Then if we destroyed the root, all the branches would die. Wouldn't that be, amen, you know, where, where, where you lost this, how am I going to put it, this temptation to look anyway. To watch anyway. Amen? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Amen? Back to John 10, 10 says what? He cometh not. Now listen. He, what, now what is that in plain English? He cometh not. He comes for no other reason. Get that. He's not coming for a cup of coffee. Not coming, not coming for a fellowship with you. He comes for no other reason. This he, who this he is, but to steal, to kill, and destroy. He's not coming to fellowship with you, not coming to give you a pat on the back, certainly not coming for a quick cuppa. He comes for no other reason but to steal, to kill and destroy. True? Amen? You see, when we think about that, the question that we need to see, that, see when, when we're in study mode, study, you cannot study outside of asking questions. And so when we read that, we need to ask the question, what is he coming to steal? You see, when I read that, to me it doesn't like he's trying to steal. It's like he's trying to steal one thing. What is it that he's trying to destroy? What is it that he, the he, wants to kill? That's what we want to know, isn't it? Amen? And if we could identify what that one thing is that he is after, we could protect it. Couldn't we? Amen? We would not be like the Bible says that the thief would not come in the night and we'd be unaware. We'd be aware. We'd be aware of what he is trying to do. And we'd be able to defend against that and protect our goods. Amen? And praise God for that. Amen? Now, I believe that if you knew what that one thing was that he's after, that that would take care of everything else. Amen? It wouldn't matter what age, what time you lived in. It wouldn't matter what was around. It would not have an effect on you. Amen? You would, if you knew what this one thing was. Amen? Now, Paul said, he said this, abstain from all appearance of evil. And that would become easy street for you. At the moment, it seems like a difficult task, almost an impossibility. But it will become possible for you and me. Amen? Yeah, it would release us 
from being in a defensive mode, always defensive, defensive, defensive. I've got to watch this. I've got to watch out for that. I'm going to be careful about this. Oh, uh, oh, oh this program. I don't, oh, what should I do now? Amen. It would protect us from being defensive, allowing us to mount the white horse. Who wants to mount the white horse? Amen. The, the Word of God says that the white horse goes forth conquering and to conquer. No defense there, brothers and sisters. He goes forth conquering and to conquer. We must get out of the defensive mode and get onto the white horse because he goes forth conquering and to conquer. Reminds me much of, of Romans chapter 8. Turn there for a, for a quick moment. You know, when you study the Word of God, it's just so wonderful, isn't it? Amen. Romans 8, and I think we want to go down the end there, verse, uh, say verse um, uh, 35, is that who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, homosexuals, effeminates, famine, nakedness, peril or sword, as it's written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep of the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Hallelujah. Amen. Through him who loved us. For I am persuaded. And this is a man who definitely riding the white horse. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angel nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, you were made, you were born again to be a conqueror. Amen. You were never born again to be defensive. Amen. You were called to go forth and to conquer. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You were called to be in a position where there was no retreat and no defeat. Amen. When you were born again, God's will and purpose for you was no condemnation, no guilt, no regret. Amen. That's what God's will for us is. That's what salvation is. True? Amen. But when you get into this defensive mode, amen, where you're just trying to plug the holes, what happens? You get caught. Amen. You get caught in sins. Amen. Then you start losing your peace. You start feeling guilty. You start having regrets. Amen. You want to start, oh God, can I just start to, the, tomorrow new again? Amen. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about this morning. Amen. You don't have to amen to me if you don't want to, but it's yet the truth. Amen. But I believe this morning, if you can guard and protect that one thing that he is after, that he wants to steal, that he wants to kill, that he wants to destroy, you'll mount the white horse and you'll never look back. You'll go forth conquering and to conquer. You'll be transformed. You'll feel like the day you were born again. You'll feel like the day you were born again. Amen. A lot of us here this morning, we become stale, old. Amen. Set in a way that is not right. We have lost that spontaneity that we had when we were first born again. When all we want to do was live for Jesus. Amen. We wanted to be his witness, his testimony. But we have built kingdoms around us now that's almost an impossibility, almost an impossibility to be the people that we thought we'd be in Christ. Amen? Because we lost the way. We became defensive, allowed things to enter our lives, started doing things in our own way, our own thoughts, and by our own determination that took us further and further away from Christ. I'm saying enough's enough. It's time that the thief stopped. 
It's time that he stopped killing us. It's time that he stopped destroying us. Because that's not the church. Amen? So let's continue this morning. I'm, I'm not being hard on anybody. I pray. <laughs> Amen? But we need to protect that one thing, one thing only that he wants. If we, we've been talking about horses, so let's go and look at the horses. Where are the horses? Let's go and have a look at the horses. <clears throat> In Revelations chapter 6. Revelations chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him had a bow and a crown. And given uh, unto him, uh, was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. We've been talking about this white horse. And went, or the rider of the white horse. <clears throat> and when he had opened up the second seal, I saw a second beast saying, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take away peace from the earth. And we see the horses up there, by the way. Amen. The white horse, the red horse the black horse, and the pale or grey horse. Amen. <clears throat> and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. And then he opened a third seal, and I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, a measure of wheat for a penny and a measure of barley for a penny and, uh, and see uh, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he'd opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse and, his, and the name uh, that, uh, uh, and, and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with a sword and with hunger and with death and, uh, and with the beasts of the earth. So there we have in Revelation chapter 6 a description of four horses. Amen? Now we all understand that the book of the Revelation is a what book? It's a book of symbols. How do we know that? Well, Revelation 1 and 1 says what? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. What's the word signified in the Greek? It's the Greek, it's the Greek word what? Semano or Semano, yes. Which means what? It means signs or tokens, doesn't it? Okay, it, it, it means to make known or to reveal by signs. It means to, to unveil something that was previously hidden. True? Amen? Uh, a good way to, to uh, understand what a token is. If we go down the road here, we'll see a sign that points to Brisbane. I mean, there's a name on there called Brisbane, but that's not Brisbane. It points to Brisbane. And when you see that sign, we get a picture of what? Rockhampton. <laughs> we do, don't we? We get a picture of Brisbane. We're going to go to Brisbane. And we know then that, that this sign is pointing to Brisbane. Well, the book of the Revelation is exactly the same. It is full of pointers, signposts, telling you, pointing you somewhere else. Amen? It is showing us pictures, symbols, pictures in our minds. Amen? Where the answer to those pictures is somewhere else in the Word of God. In other words, the book of the Revelation is not given to just anybody. It's given to those who first are His servants, and second to those who will spend the time and effort in searching out where the pointer is pointing. If we don't do that, we'll never know. 
Amen? We'll never, never know. <laughs> Amen? So, what do the four horses represent? And of course, to do that, we have to go to the book of Zechariah. The, Ze the book of Zechariah gives all the answers. Amen? That's where the signpost is pointing. Go to Zechariah. It says, go to Zechariah. Amen? Also, if you're, if you're confused about the book of the Revelation, in Revelation chapter 8, it says it is the vision. Visions are symbolic. They're not literal. So we go to Zechariah, which is in the Old Testament there towards the end, for those who don't know. When you've gone past Matthew, you're heading in the right direction, as long as you're going that way. Zechariah chapter 10. And let's find out something about these horses. Because we want to find out what it is that he's after. What's he want to steal? Or what does he want to kill? What does he want to destroy? And so in Zechariah 10 and verse 3 it says what? My anger was kindled against the shepherds and I punished the goats. The Lord of hosts have visited us his flock. Uh, uh, his flock, the house of Judah, and have made them as goodly horses in the battle. What do horses represent? Battle, don't they? Back in Bible times, horses were the vehicle for battle. Like in our time now, of course, we have troop carriers. We have tanks, we have you know, warships, we have, all right, they are now the vehicles of warfare. Amen? But back in biblical times, the horse was the vehicle of warfare. It carried the soldier. Amen? You get the picture? Amen? So that was the purpose of a horse. A horse was to be the vehicle of warfare. We go back a chapter or two to chapter 6. There you go. Amen. Yeah, even back in the, was that, was that the First World War? Amen. That horses are a symbol of warfare. Amen. It, it's, for some reason, a, a, a horse is, I'm going to say comfortable, is quite happy to run forth in the midst of a battle without being afraid. All right? It, it, it protects its rider. But of course, you need to understand that, that the horse is the vehicle only. And so when we're looking at these four horses, all right, it, they are vehicles for the rider that sits on the horse. Amen? So in Zechariah chapter 6, and verse 1 says what? And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out of, uh, from between the two mountains, and the mountains, uh, and the mountains were mounds of brass. And the first chariot were red horses, the second chariot black horses, the third chariot white horses, and in the fourth chariot gristled and bay horses, or the pale horse. So we have the four horses. Amen? Praise the Lord. Uh, verse 4. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my Lord? Now, listen, if you don't ask the question, you'll never, never know. God will not answer you unless you ask. He won't. God will not meet a request you do not make. We need to understand that. Amen? Amen. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled, or they shall be satisfied. If you don't ask, you won't be satisfied. And so, so here, Zechariah asks the question. He says, what are they? Uh, verse 5, And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens which go forth from the standing before the Lord of all the earth. 
These are the four spirits of the heavens. What heavens? The heaven of God. See, again, what, what are we dealing with here in the book of Zechariah? We're dealing with another vision. So we're dealing again with symbolic language, not literal language, pictures. Again, we've got some pictures here. Amen? And we are told that these are the, if you like, the four spirits. And of course, the number four is a number again of completion, of all. So we can more or less say, hey, uh, here we are seeing the token of all spirits. Of all spirits. Amen. Represented by these four horses. And all spirits will be on one of these four horses. Does that make sense to you? Or not? Amen. So we understand then that, this, that the heavens here is the heavenly place spoken of in Ephesians chapter 2. The ecclesiastical or the religious heaven. So we understand then that these four horses represent religious spirits. The white horse represents a religious spirit. The red horse does, the black horse does, and the pale horse does. They represent religious spirits. They are the spirits of the heavens. Amen? Why the colors? Again, we're dealing with symbolism. I mean, we look at the white horse. I mean, they, they, are, they are specific colors for a purpose. It wasn't just random black, random pale. Well, we need a red one because, you know, red's danger. So let's make it red, danger. No, not at all. That's not why it's red. I mean, what does white stand for? I mean, we, we, are, we, we are clothed in the, in the white robes, are we not? The robes of righteousness, purity, holiness. Amen? So this, this horse is white. So what spirit is that horse? It must be the Holy Spirit. Isn't he holy? Is he not pure? So the white horse is the Holy Spirit, amen? But what is he? In the light of what we understand of horses, the Holy Spirit is the vehicle. Get that, he is the vehicle. He carries something. He bears something. He bears the rider, and of course, uh, you know, we, we could say, yes, the rider is Jesus Christ. But listen, Jesus Christ is not out, not without his wife, the church. Yes. Not possible for it. See, that's really depicted wrong. He's not on it by himself. Amen. The Holy Spirit bears the church, carries the church. Amen. He is the vehicle by which the church goes forth conquering and to conquer. Amen. The moment you step away from the white horse and on your own, you're in defeat. It was Paul who said in the New Covenant, he said, you must be led by the Spirit. You must be born by the Spirit. I mean, born carried by the Spirit. Amen. We find, amen, that, that, that the rider of the white horse is carrying a what? He's carrying a bow. His weapon is a bow. Of course, our so-called Christian brothers in America think it's a gun. That's how stupid they are. You know, there are even, I found out this weekend that there are even some Church of God ministers who carry a gun in their car. What's wrong with them? That is not the weapon that God gives us. He gives us a bow. And what does a bow represent? A covenant, doesn't it? Noah's, back in Noah's day. The rainbow was symboli symbolized the covenant God made with Noah. Amen? The bow is the new covenant. The covenant that God makes with you and me when we are born again. True? True? Amen? That's our weapon today. The new covenant. 
The new covenant says, when they smite you on this cheek, give them the other cheek. Don't shoot them. Amen? If, if they want your coat, I mean, don't shoot them. Give them your coat. The new covenant is, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Amen? Now, the truth? Or did we miss something along the way? Obviously, a lot of people did. Amen? So the Holy Spirit bears the church. And the church goes forth on the Holy Spirit, or on the white horse, goes forth conquering and to conquer. Amen? Now, here we are. When we are born again, we mount the white horse. And if, if you can remember back to that day, you surely did. Who knows? You thought you were unbeatable. Who remembers? You felt so pure and so clean and just met a new page in your life. You mounted the white horse. And then at that point you thought, hey, this is just going to go on and on and on and on. It's just going to be terrific. Nothing will ever stand against me again. And that's what God's will was for you and me. But sadly what happened is, well sadly, it's just how it is. There came an opposing force. Who remembers that? Amen. What was the first opposing force to the white horse? The red horse. The red horse is the first opposing vehicle that was going to try and conquer us. You know, war, these are horses of warfare. You can't just sit on a white horse and not fight something. Amen? You're on the, there's something going to oppose you. Amen? And the first opposing force to the white horse is the red horse. Amen? So let's have a look what that is. And, uh, you uh, so let's go back to Zechariah. Oh, we're still in Zechariah. That's good. Let's go to chapter 1. Find out some more about this horse. Zechariah 1 and 8. <clears throat> it says, And I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. It's a good sign, isn't it? See, how difficult is this really when you think about it? Just a bit of effort, isn't it? Hey, isn't it just a bit of time? Just sit down quietly with your Bible, with your uh, search thing, whatever you have. Now, it's not that difficult, is it? You know, red horse. I want to find out about a red horse. Well, search red horse. Oh, Zechariah chapter 1. How about that? Hey. I always thought that that was, my, was the Holy Spirit leading me. <laughs> I, <laughs> I saw when I and behold a man riding a red horse. This that fella. This that over there. See that? He's riding a red horse. <clears throat> and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom. And behind him were uh, red horses, speckled and white. Then said I, okay, I've got to ask a question. What's going on here, Lord? What's this all about? He says, he says Oh, Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show you thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord have sent to walk to and throw through the earth. Notice this now. Not on the earth, but to, to and throw through the earth. Got to get that. And not saying that, that these horses are walking upon the earth, but somehow are going through the earth. True? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> again, we know that this is symbolic language. So we know again that we're dealing with a signpost, a pointer to somewhere else. Because this in itself doesn't make sense, doesn't identify the rider or the horse. Amen? Now, can any of you remember anywhere else in the Bible where there was something walking on the earth? 
Very similar to this. In fact, the wording was almost exactly the same. <coughs> huh? Well, let's go. Yeah, we all got the wrong answer, but that's all right. <coughs> let's go to the book of Job. And we find the exact same. If you had got your search thing going, you would have found it for sure. Let's go to Job chapter 1. <clears throat> Remember, the Bible interprets all symbols for us. We don't have to guess. We just got to find them. Amen. So in Job chapter 1, what does it say? <clears throat> and verse number 6. It says, And there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Where did you come from? And uh, then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro, to and fro in the earth, and walking up and down. Now, how you, you can interpret that in several different ways. But let's just interpret it in a real spiritual way. He goes through, to and fro, to and fro, to and fro, and then he goes up and down. A bit like a MRI scanner, up and down. He goes in, up and down. He goes in, up and down. How did he find Job? He went in and up and down. The rider of this second horse, he goes in, up and down. So we understand that the first opposition that comes our way is like an examination, a temptation, a test, a trial. Isn't that what happened with you? And of course, if you're not grounded right, you'll be defeated. Family comes against you, tone it down, and you tone it down, you're defeated. And then because you do not understand that he comes for no other reason but to kill, to steal, to kill and destroy. Okay? Now we're kind of getting the picture now, what's going on here. Amen? Notice he goes in the earth, in the earth, and then he goes up and down. Now he does. He goes in, up and down. He is God's agent of examination. He's God's agent of test. He's God's agent to see where you're at. Amen? That's what he does. Because how, how did he know about Job? Unless he knew the very inner workings of Job himself. Hey God, you know that Job won't forsake you. I've searched him. I've gone up and down. There's nothing in him. And God, you're protecting him. I can see, because God, I can see what's going on on the inside. Yeah, so, God, so he said to God, he says, now, I, I want to I really put the hammer down on this guy. I'm going to take everything away from all his temporal things. Everything temporal. Everything that was temporal. Everything that, was, everything that was of the earth, he took away. Everything. How would you go if, if suddenly you lost everything you possessed? Everything. I mean, business, blotto gone, in the dust. Debts up to here. House, new house gone. How would you feel? And that's finished there. You lose whole family dead. How would you feel? That's what happened to Job. That's the test that he was put under. But yet he said, I held his step. <laughs> In all this he did not sin. Held his step. Because he knew something. He knew something about this red horse. He knew something about this red horse. 
He knew there was something going on, where something was trying, some, something was trying to steal from him more than his possessions. Something far more important. Something far, far more important. But notice here in, in the book of Job that there are searching words, examining words. The first thing that comes against you when you're born again, when you hop on the white horse, is a confrontation with the red horse. Cannot be avoided. The red horse opposes you comes against you. Amen? Somebody mentioned before from 1 Peter 5 and 8, somebody go to 1 Peter 5 and 8. If you don't believe it, I think there's some people who call themselves Christians who don't believe the devil will ever come against them again. <clears throat> what, somebody read 1 Peter 5 and 8. Be sober, be vigilant. You know, hey, do you, do you think that in, that, in, that, in, that in today's modern day army the soldiers are half drunk? You know, well, oh, well, we're going to go into battle now. Let's, uh, hey, let's get a bottle of whiskey and let's just have a good squig. Let's build our spirits up for the battle, all right? And then they're all tipsy as they, as they go out to fight. Never. These people are, these guys are sharp, aware vigilant. Amen. That they are looking for the rustle in the trees. Vigilant. Amen. They are predetermining where the enemy is. They are vigilant. They are sober. Amen. They want the drop on the enemy. But sadly for many of us, it seems the enemy always has the drop on us. And I thought well, we serve the God who foretold us. But many times when trouble comes our way, it's a big surprise. Well, I'll tell you what, when trouble came Paul's way, he didn't seem very surprised. When trouble came Peter's way, he didn't seem very surprised. He, he just felt so comfortably went to sleep in prison. True? Amen. Amen. So what does it say in 158 again? 1 Peter 5 8. So he's tromping around right here on the earth somewhere, looking around. Now he's a spirit. He doesn't walk around on terra firma. He's a spirit. And he has whole minions of spirits. He, he, he even has some that walk around on terra firma that are filled with spirits. Amen? You see, it pays to remember something very important. No matter how long you've been in, doesn't matter how long you've been in, the devil believes that he, Satan believes that he can get you back. And he will do everything within his strength and power until the day you die to get you back because he believes he can do it. He has belief in that. He never gives up. He's at you 24-7. We're in a battle. Amen? He can get you. You know... With all the carry-on in the world today with the Islamists and so forth, people get worried and concerned. But I tell you this morning that our enemy is not atheism. Our enemy is not evolution. Our enemy this morning is not Judaism. And it's not Islam, what do they call it? Is it Islamist, Islam something or other? Islam. There's a plural Islam. That is not our enemy. What is our enemy today? There he is here. He is the sheep in wolves' clothing. That's your enemy. Sorry, the wolf in sheep's clothing, sorry. <laughs> I was getting excited with myself. <laughs> My eyes was playing tricks on me. 
Can you see that? Your enemy, you need to get this firmly into your heart and believe this. Your enemy is the wolf who looks like a sheep. But according to Revelation chapter 13, is empowered by the first beast, which is empowered by paganism itself, the dragon. That is your enemy. That's what can defeat you. That's what can trick you. And some of you have already been bitten by this wolf in sheep's clothing. I know it. Amen? Oh, those Baptists, they can't be all bad. Huh? See? They're being nibbled on. Amen? Oh, those Pentecostals, oh, they do love Jesus. Oh, you just had another little nibble. That's like a rat eating at you now. Amen? Oh, those seven-day Adventists, look at them. Man, they believe in holiness and right living and so forth. Hey, it's another, it's just, it's just being nibbled again. Hey, man, the, the, the wolf is biting you. You see, what's the problem with all these? They won't take his name. They won't take his name. They are not the church of God. Hey, man, they want everything else but the name. Huh? Hey, man. You see, you have to believe that there is one church, one church, and it goes by his name, the Church of God. And I'm not talking about, per se, a building or a name on a document. But there is only one church, and that's the church, the Church of God, and she is the container of all the truth. Amen. I battle with these characters over in Kenya who fool around with every other person, every other thing. It makes me so angry. It just shows me how little they really know, how immature and novices some of these people are. Nobody outside of the church of God can teach you or show you anything. Nothing at all. Amen. But being deceived by the wolf in sheep's clothing. Amen? You see, the truth is, there is, there is an enemy trying to destroy you. There is. Amen? Hey, they're not trying to destroy the Pentecostals. Amen? This enemy is not trying to destroy the Baptists. I promise you. Doesn't care one iota. Doesn't care about the Seventh-day Adventists. Not trying to destroy them one single bit. But the moment you are the church of God, that's who he's after. He's after the people of God. Amen. That's whom he wants to destroy. Amen. So the red horse, let's look at the vehicle for a moment. The vehicle. And the vehicle color is what? Red. It's red. So it's a symbol. So what does the color red stand for? Well, you would have all remembered, it does, and it does not. We know that this is not a good horse. All right, so who remembers what it says in, one, in, in um, Isaiah 1 verse 18? Who wants to go there for a moment? Somebody go to, let's go to, go to Isaiah 1 verse 18. This is so simple, but yet so profound. What's it say? 118. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet. Scarlet is red. Keep going. Amen. Though they be as crimson, again, that's red. They shall be as wool. So... Red stands for what? Sin. sin. Stands for sin. Amen? The red horse represents sin. Or better still, let's put it this way. The red horse, his weapon is sin. Just as you have the bow, the rider of the red horse, that sword represents sin. He's trying to kill. 
Amen? Now, how is he going to do that? It's a question, isn't it? Well, let's go over to the book of Joram. How is he going to do this? See, we need to know what's coming against us. And we want to know how God protects us. In, one John, sorry, in John 1 and verse 29, remember the story, John the Baptist sees Jesus coming. And uh, he says in verse 29, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Now some of our brethren might think that this sin, no singular, the sin, is the Adamic, the sin nature, and then two works, entire sanctification. But we know that is just not true. Amen? But Jesus did not come, notice now, listen, Jesus did not come to take away sins, plural. He did not do that. Because if that were true, we'd have to have Christ on the cross continually for all time. He didn't come to take away sins. He came to take away the sin. Because if we take away the sin, there are no sins. You see, the Roman Catholics, what do they do? They have Christ continually on a cross. Because they are continuing in their sins. So they have to. The Pentecostals have got no idea what they're doing. Amen. They just say, well, just say sorry every night and you'll be all right. Because they're just the daughters of the Roman Catholics anyway. Amen. They, 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 they don't dare have Christ on a cross, but yet every night they put Christ back on the cross because they want them to deal with their sins. What do the Baptists do? Well, the Baptists just throw everything up in the air and say, forget about it all, it's one saved, always saved. So just sin at will, doesn't matter anymore. Amen? Because they do not understand that if you take care of the sin, you won't have to deal with the sins. Jesus came to take away the sin, not sins. He didn't die for sins. He died for the sin. Because he had to give you power to overcome. Power to be a conqueror. Power to confront the first horse that would come against you. And the Pentecostals won't tell you that. The Baptists won't tell you about the red horse. I mean, the Seventh-day Adventists won't tell you about the red horse. Because they are. They are this, the wolf in sheep's clothing. They are trying to trick us. Amen? You see, you don't go to hell because you commit sins. You go to hell because of the sin. Amen? You don't go to hell because you're a drunkard, a pedophile, a homosexual, a lesbian, a murderer, a killer. You don't go to hell for that. You go to hell because of the sin. Amen? The sin. Amen? Take away the sin and there are no sins. Amen? Plug the one hole, you plug all holes. Amen? You see, what is the sin from which all others follow? That's what I want to know. Well, again, let's go to Revelation chapter 6 and see what this red horse does. What does he do in verse 4? What does he do? That's it. To take the peace from the earth. What? He's going to take care you know, to, to, you know, the, the, the warfare in Syria. That's all his fault. There's always been wars. There's always been famines. 
It's going to take away the peace from the earth. So when you were born again, who had this real sense of peace? You were settled. True? What happens when you commit sins? What happens to your peace? It's gone, isn't it? See, you've been overcome by the red horse because that's what he does. He has been given authority to take away the peace from the earth. We're dealing with symbolism, remember, not literal earth, human earth. Amen, can we see that? Amen. So whatever this thus sin is, it takes away your peace. That's what it does. It kills. It destroys. It steals your testimony. True? You lose the joy of your salvation. That's what you lose. Amen. When you lose the peace of God, what else is there? You, you, you can't readily stand up and praise God if you've lost, amen, the peace that would pass all understanding. Now, people people are not lost. People are not sinners because of what they do. They are sinners because of who they are. Do you understand that? People are not sinners because of what they do. People are sinners because of who they are. If you change who they are, you, and I'm on the righteous side, they are no longer sinners. Does that make sense to you? You know, this idea that you sin will, sin you must, or you can't help but sin every day in thought, word, and deed is, is of course, foolishness. Because it goes contrary to what we're saying here. Amen? So if you want to change a sinner, what have you got to do? You've got to change who they are. Amen? No point pointing at the sins, because they're going to continue to do the sins no matter what you say. Because they can't help but do those sins all the time. Because that's who they are. I mean, it's, it's no point, you know, looking at a homosexual in a derogatory, you know, uh, way because they can't change. It's who they are. They're sinners. The only way is to change who they are. They must be born again so they'd be no longer sinners. Amen? You see, as I said, you can reform a thief, a thief, <laughs> thief. Can't you? Yes. Hey, you can reform a drunkard. Does that make them saved? Does that mean they go to heaven now? No. Because they're still who they are. Sinners. Yes. Amen. See, hell is, I mean, hell is full of good people. Full of them. Amen. Lovely old grannies who cared and loved their families gave their lives for their families, and they're all in hell. Amen. You, you think of you know, uh, people who, who, who just give on themselves to give to humanity. Good people. You know, think of all these doctors and nurses, amen, who are beyond the dollar. Who are beyond the dollar. And are doing it because of their love for humanity. You think of some of these doctors who are in these war fronts, Amen, uh, who are there purely so they can mend and help and repair these broken people. But yet unless they are born again, unless they are changed from who they are, they remain sinners. And all their good works still sends them to hell because of the sin. What does one, John 1.29 say again? In case we forgot. Who's still over that way? Anybody? We're all going to go there anyway. Yeah, we are. If, if your Bible's hot, you should go straight back there, shouldn't it? What does is, what is, what is, what is verse 9, 20, 20, 29 say again? It said, it said, it said uh, um, uh, if I'm, that's the one. 
John seeth Jesus coming, and what did he say? Behold! I was like, wow, look at this! Here comes victory! Here comes our deliverer! Here comes our power, our weapon! Behold the Lamb who taketh away the sin of the world. Go to chapter 16. What is this sin? What is this sin? What is the sin? Chapter 16, verse number 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sins. No, not sins. He doesn't reprove of sins. He reproves of the sin. The sin. That's it. We're going to get through our heads. God's not, inter- and the Lord doesn't, not interested in whether you're a homosexual, whatever. doesn't care. Whether you're a murderer, a pedophile, whatever. A child killer. doesn't care. You're not going to hell because of that. You're going to hell because of the sin. And if you can get this thing around your head, if these people who are vile and decrepit, if they can get this thing around their head and take advantage and take the power of their sin, they can be delivered and be as white and as pure as you are. Amen? Where were we? Verse 8. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of Sin, the sin. Verse 9, of sin because they believe not on me. What is the sin? Unbelief. The sin is unbelief. Jesus Christ came to deliver you from unbelief. I mean, he hung on that cross to empower you to believe. That's what he did. He says, so the key is, if you believe, sins will have no hold on you. If you believe the word of God, you are immune to it. Are you getting it? If you believe the word of God, the white horse won't conquer you, so the red horse will not conquer you. You will conquer it. Remember back when you were first born again, what was the first thing that came against you? Some person or some spirit, well, when we speak of person, some spirit in a person telling you to do something you knew you shouldn't be doing. Isn't that right? Amen. Some, some person who is filled with the Spirit telling you to calm down. Some person telling you, oh, born again. What are you? Become a cult. Well, what was it? It was the red horse. Amen. Trying to get you into a state of unbelief. Amen. His sword is unbelief. You, you, but you were given the bow, the new covenant, and all the benefits that come with the new covenant, power to overcome. That's what you got. That's what I got. We were given sufficient to, to overcome the red, the black, and the pale horse and go right on into glory. Jesus came to deliver us from the sin. What is the sin? Unbelief. It's just plain and simple, isn't it? See, the moment you disbelieve God, what follows? Sins. Sins. It's simple. Amen. If you ignore the sin, what follows is sins. Amen. It's just natural. It's how it's going to happen. Amen. The moment you disbelieve what God says in his word, sins will come. Amen? The moment you disbelieve that God wants you to dress modestly, I tell you what, sins will come. 
Amen? The moment that, uh, that, you, know, that, uh, that uh, you think you can go to the movies and watch whatever you want to, to watch, guarantee it. Sins will come because God says not to do that. Amen? When you disbelieve God, you're in unbelief. Amen? Uh, true or not? See, tell me, you see, what is the weapon of the red horse? What's the, what's the rider got? Unbelief. In fact, the rider is unbelief. Amen? And his weapon is to tempt you to disbelieve God. That's it. Now, if that be true, if the red horse is the first opposer, let's go right back to the beginning where we have Adam and Eve. What was the first opposing force they confronted? What was it? Unbelief. They were tempted to disbelieve God. Amen. God says, don't. Amen. The serpent says, yeah, but. Come on, it looks pretty good. Amen. It looks good to eat, doesn't it? You know what he said? He says, have God said. He says, the questioning. Have God said. I mean, uh, this is too good to just hang on a tree and die. Let's use it. And then, then of course, the, the real sneaky one is this here. Hey, listen, the reason why God doesn't want you to have it. You know the reason why God doesn't want you to have it? Because if you take it, you'll be just like him. You shall be as gods. Notice that? The very first temptation they faced, remember, God made them, God saved them, God, well, saved them, they were pure. As pure beings, God placed them in the garden. They weren't born in the garden. They were placed in the garden. The garden is the type of the church. The garden of Eden is the church. It's paradise. Amen. In the midst of the book of the Revelation, in the midst of paradise is the tree of life. Well, the tree of life is way back there in the book of Genesis in the garden, which is the church. Now what happened when they got themselves into unbelief? What came? They were happy, joyful. What happened? They felt guilty, regret, covered themselves up. Amen? And God physically threw them out of the church because they committed the sin. It was not stealing wasn't the issue. That wasn't the issue. Lying wasn't the issue. That's what sinners do. Amen? That's not what makes you a sinner. What makes you a sinner is the sin, which is to disbelieve God. Amen? Right there, the very beginning. There you have it. Exactly what I'm trying to show you. Every time you disbelieve God, at the moment you, you, you do something contrary to the Word of God, you put yourself in the same position as Adam and Eve. And what follows unbelief is sins. Always follows. Amen? In, in uh, Eve's case, it turned into becoming a thief. Stealing what did not belong to her. And then, and then the two of them uh, lying and blaming each other. See, it always leads to sins. God says, I said to you this morning, that if you will live in belief, because that's what he's coming to steal, your belief. He wants to destroy your belief. He wants to uh, 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 um, kill your belief. Because once he does that, that which Jesus died for no longer applies to you. You kind of, you remove yourself from under the blood. That's what you do? Uh, well, whatever. I'm just, I keep it nice and simple this morning. I keep it nice and simple, all right? The moment you disbelieve what God has written to you in the book, the moment you think you can live contrary to the book, you're in unbelief. Now, see if we're right again. We go to Mark chapter 16. We go to verse 15. It says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, you and I who have been around for a while know that the gospel is to what? What are we to preach? Belief. Belief. We are to preach belief. How do we preach belief? By just let it guzzle out of our mouths. No. 
We are supposed to live belief. We are supposed to be living epistles. We are supposed to be representing and showing the belief of God, the Word of God. Because what comes next is so important. It says, and they that believe, believe, and are baptized shall be saved. Notice it. And those who continue to drink and womanize and commit adultery shall be damned. No! That is not why they are damned. It's because they do not believe. And they that believe not shall be damned. It's all about belief. Belief. And can you imagine then what it's like if you claim to be a Christian and not living belief? Huh? Really then, you're just the rider of the red horse, aren't you? Well, we need to be the rider of the white horse. Amen. Did you notice that it's all about belief? Amen? If you don't believe the testimony of Jesus Christ, you are in trouble. And sins will surely follow. Amen? Will surely follow. I'm going to skip a little bit now. Um, we all know what uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, tells us about the sin. Somebody quickly go, Hebrews 12, verse 1. What does it say? Quickly, Hebrews 12, verse 1. The time's almost up. Seeing also combusted, because you know, when you look at, say, Hebrews 12, it's followed by, uh, before there was Hebrews 11, sometimes you wonder, what's Hebrews 11 doing in there? You know, the book of Hebrews is all about kind of like doctrine and theology and, right, and showing us the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and then suddenly you've got this chapter 11, and it's all about these guys in the Old Testament. Where's Paul's testimony? Where's Peter's te- Where's John's testimony in there? Amen? Where, where's Priscilla? Aquila, where, where's their testimony in there? That's what I'd expect to see. I want to see some testimonies of the New Testament believers. But they're not there. It's all Old Testament. It's funny, isn't it? But there are examples for us because of what he says next. What does it say again? Amen. Look at these guys who didn't have the Spirit as you have the Spirit. And what? And the sin, the sin, the sin, not sins. Sins are never the problem. It's the sin that so easily besets us. It is so easy to get yourself into unbelief, to compromise, to turn a blind eye. That's what he's saying. It's so easy to do that. But the moment you do that or think you're going to do that, think about the guys in Hebrews 11. They did it without the Spirit. You have the Spirit as your vehicle. Amen. John 3, who knows John 3, 16? The most, probably the most quoted verse in all the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth, see it's all about belief, believeth on him. What? Should not perish but have everlasting life. John 1 12. Who knows what John 1 12 says? But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. Who? Well, these ones. Even them who believe on his name. Psalm 138 tells us that God esteems his word above his name. In other words, God is his word. The book of the Revelation shows us, amen, uh, uh, toward, you know, it shows us Jesus Christ, uh, his name is the word of God. Amen. <laughs> is this making sense to you or not? Amen. You see, as we finish up, our problem is not in the, the things and the events. That's not our problem. Amen? Our struggle is not with alcohol or drugs or foul mouth or lying or... 
Paul said, our warfare is not flesh and blood. It's none of those things. It's simply unbelief. He, the thief, cometh not but to steal your belief. He comes to destroy your belief. He comes to kill your belief. That's all he does. And if you know that, and if you confront that, you cannot be defeated. You'll go forth conquering and to conquer. You'll fulfill God's will and purpose. You know, brother, sister, if you're not seeking the kingdom day in, day out, if you're not working for the kingdom day in, day out, if you're not working in your jobs, your works, your houses for the kingdom, you're in unbelief. You're in unbelief. If you're not seeking his righteousness all the time, 24-7, oh, a few hours for sleep, in your dreams. Well, that's, really, if we're saved, we ought to have good dreams, shouldn't we? No comment. Everything you do, your work, your breath, your pleasure, ought to be to the kingdom and his righteousness, surely. Because if we don't, that sword will get you. That sword will get you. Amen? It will get you. Amen? Your salvation will sour. Who is a sour salvation here this morning? God can help you. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, that in uh, uh, John, 1 John 2, I mean, we have an advocate, an advocate with the Father. That if you do commit sins, there it says sins, I believe. Not the sin, sins. So it's already gone beyond. You've already gone beyond the sin. You yet have an advocate with the Father. He will forgive you if you're honest, if you admit, accept, own. Amen. But I tell you that when salvation sours, your joy will go, your spontaneity will go. You'll not be, you'll not want to be who you are. You'll be dissatisfied with holiness, grizzle and grumble. Amen. Tell you what, you know when things are slipping, when your mouth starts to run off. Eh? You know, you know you're slipping uh, when you find yourself in a position where you suddenly are about to say a word you know you should not say. Hey, sins are at the door. Sins are at the door. But there's a way back. There is a way back. Amen? There is a way back. You can get back on the white horse. You can. But I want to tell you this more. This is not rocket science. It's very simple. I think the prophet, prophet I, uh, I, uh, Mazar said it was so simple. This way that we're on. It is so simple that even the wayfaring man will not fail. It is so simple. Just believe Jesus. Know that the red horse is coming. Know it. See, some of you are going to go home. Have your lunch. And I guarantee for some of you, the red horse will be at the table. Guarantee it. The red horse will be at the table. But I want to tell you something this morning. He's not coming to eat your meal your lunch. He's coming to kill you, destroy you. Amen. Some of you will go home and say, oh, that brother Gil, he goes over the top. Oh, he's picking on me. That'll happen. No, the red horse and his rider are at the table. Amen. What we have studied out this morning is plain and simple. It is the scriptures. It is the truth. Jesus Christ never came to settle sins. 
for then he would be forever having to hang on a cross. He was offered once, the word of God, Hebrews, offered once for all. He was offered for the root, unbelief. And then he gave us power to believe. Amen. Gave us power to believe. Put us on a goodly vehicle, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would lead us, sure, into battle, but would lead us in such a way that we would overcome and conquer. Amen? The only way that red horse can get you with that sword, you've got to get off the horse. That's all. Amen? I uh, pray I've been a help to you this morning. Um, all I can say to you, myself included, I've just got to believe Jesus. In uh, Hebrews chapter 12, you know, after, after Paul talked about you know, the, the, the sin that so easily besets us, then he said, looking unto Jesus. That's how we do it. Looking unto Jesus. Don't don't look at the consequences. Well, you know, if, 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 uh, if I do it Jesus' way, and, and, and then it'll, that it'll turn out this way. No, 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 no. Look to him. Nothing else. Don't worry about what else happens. If you look unto him, sins will not follow you. But righteousness, that which is just and right. Amen? Praise God. I pray we've been a help this morning.